Welcome back to this old house in Barrington, Rhode Island. Today we'll install a retractable awning that can sense the wind. So if there are wind gusts comes by that will damage it, we'll retract it back in. That's a nice feature to have. We'll see how blacksmiths are making our light fixtures one by one. In this area we have 10 people. Typically on a good day we'll put out a thousand products. Wow. And we'll show you a new way to seal soapstone countertops. That's coming up next on This Old House. Well, there are only a few more weeks left here on our Barrington, Rhode Island project. We started with a simple Cape Cod style house, and it's gone through a pretty dramatic transformation. I think it looks great. Now, one of the features that the house had was an awning. The fabric was gone. It was a pipe frame that was all rusted. So today, we're replacing it with a modern awning. An awning on this side of the house is going to do a couple things for our homeowners, especially in the summer. It's going to shade the inside of the house, keeping it cooler, and it's going to give them nice shade so they can sit out here on the deck. Now, our new awning is brought to us by Mike Cornell. Hey, Mike. Hi, Norm. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Now, we had a pipe frame awning. Now we have one that looks like it's floating in space. Yes, we do. The homeowner decides to replace that pipe frame awning with a retractable awning. Uh -huh. Now, what, what's holding it all up? It looks like a metal frame. Yeah, it's actually a powder-coated aluminum frame. And what it does is that these arms right here have high-tension springs in it, which gives it a tremendous amount of force to keep that fabric taut. Right, nice and tight. Now, it's important to pitch an awning, right? That is correct. The ideal height to mount it at is at nine feet. Right, so that frame right there that's bolted to the house. Yeah, that's correct. And what that does is that gives you an ideal pitch in order to, to get the water to run off. And also at the same point in time, it maximizes the shade. Right. So an awning really is meant for shade. It's not meant if there's torrential rain. That is correct. It will take a light rain, but uh, anything that's moderate or heavy, it should be retracted. All right, so how do you retract it? Do you have to crank it well, in? Well, no, well, you can crank it. There is a manual crank, but also what we have to do is we have a nifty remote right here. You and a with a push of the remote? button, yeah, wireless RF technology, push of the button, it retracts right back in. Wow, that works great. Yeah, pretty neat. Now, another thing I get concerned about with an awning like this is near the ocean, especially, you get high winds. Occasionally, just a big gust will come along. So you should keep it closed when you're not here, but if you leave and you forget, what's going to happen? Well, that's the, absolutely. And what they have is a, uh, a motion detector. It's actually a wind sensor. Huh. It goes on the front bar, attaches right to the front bar, and it detects a sudden jerk in motion. So if there are wind gusts comes by, that will damage it, it will retract it back in. So if this jumps up and down, it's going to close it? It's going to close that's it. That's a nice feature to have. Now, I also noticed that it retracts into what looks like a hood, so that's going to protect it in the off-season. Yes, it will, and I can show you that hood from upstairs if you'd like to take a look at it. Okay. Let me put it out for you. All right. So here's the hood, and it blends in perfectly with the trim. Anything special about the fabric? Well, the fabric is engineered for outdoor application. It comes with a 10-year warranty. Uh, it's cleanable and it's fade resistant. Oh, that's great. Well, I think this is a feature our homeowners are going to really enjoy. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Norm. Our kitchen countertops have arrived, and they come to us compliments of Alyssa St. Jolais. Alyssa, good to see you. Hi, nice to see you too, Kevin. So what are we putting down here for material? The material we're putting down is Saratoga soapstone. The color is still water gray, and it comes from Brazil. Wow, all the way from Brazil, okay. So we've got uh, one, two, three, we got four pieces, uh, which means one seam over in this corner. And I guess that's really the hallmark of a good installation job, is how well you do on the seams. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, the way that we do the seams is we pretty much mix the epoxy with different colors, and mm -hmm. that's the real trick to getting a good seam is making sure that color blends in with the background and it's not popping out at your eye. And now he's adding in the hardener and what that does is going to help the epoxy to start curing. Now he's spreading the epoxy along the entire seam and he's going to cover every area of it to make sure there are no voids. He is now attaching the vacuum clamps and what they're going to do is keep the two pieces level and use just the right amount of pressure to keep that seam together while it's forming. 
and it sets up in how long? It takes about an hour for it to set. Okay, so we'll let them set that. But here at the island, we've actually got a single piece of stone, so no seams necessary. I saw you guys set it into a bead of silicone. We saw one go around the perimeter of the sink. Um, and we've got an opening for the sink, which you guys did off-site. But here on site, you actually drilled the hole for the faucet. We only need one. Only one. It's a single hole faucet. All right. So it's a beautiful piece of stone. I mean, it's got all this veining, all this movement here, um, which is very dramatic. It's also very gray. But if we were to wet this, it would get darker. What's the finished look we're going for? What we're going to go for is a very vibrant look. The homeowner gets the choice as to if they want to leave it like this or if they want us to apply the soapstone wax. Okay. Now, so you say wax. So I've heard of uh, mineral oils going down before. Why do you guys use the wax? Well, we use the wax basically wow, look because at that. it is an all-natural product. The base of this is carnauba wax. Carnauba is uh, what comes from the palm plant. It does, yes, and it's harder than beeswax. So what that does is it stays on a lot longer than most oils would. You would usually have to oil your countertop about every two times a year, probably with oil. Mm -hmm. But with the wax, you only have to do it about once a year. Okay. And it really darkens it. I mean, yes. you can see the difference between the gray without it and with. And look at it pull out that veining right there. Yeah, so it pretty much, it makes that color just pop out at you. And it's simply just a process of putting the wax on, buffing it in, and you're all set? Yep, exactly. So it's very easy for a homeowner to do it, and it's a lot easier to put on than oil would be. All right, well, it looks beautiful. We really appreciate you guys helping us out with the counters. No, thank you. All right, thanks, Alyssa. The stairway from the basement to the first floor is totally enclosed by walls. But from the first floor to the second floor, they wanted to open it up a bit. Now, there were a couple different choices. You could have balusters with a handrail, or this solution, a solid wall at the slope that matches the stair itself. To dress up the top of the wall, we're using a piece of oak, and underneath it, this scotia, to give it a little detail. The oak is going to get finished like the stair treads. The scotia will get painted like the trim. Now, there are a couple more pieces to install, a slope piece from this landing to the second floor, and then a horizontal piece up here. So which one do you want to start with? I want to start with the sloped one. Uh, so it comes up, dies into this wall, and then we'll finish it off with the wall cap. All right, sounds good. Let's go make some cuts. We rip each piece of oak to the correct width, plane the sawn edge, and then give it a light sanding. Okay, I'll center it here down at the bottom. Okay, that looks good. And I'm good here. I'll mark for our wall. All right, because you're going to have to notch that. It's going to run by just a little bit. All right, and then we need to mark for our angle. I'll use this Scotia as our scribe. There we go. Back to the saw. So I've set the saw to the angle that we did with the scribe, and now I'm going to cut it down to this line here. And I'm going to finish it off with the coping saw. Now we round over all the sharp edges with a light sanding. All right, now a little bit of construction adhesive to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Very nice. All right. Set this right in place. Okay. All right, Andy, before you nail it, I'm going to take a piece of Scotia and make sure we got it set in the right place so we're going to have a nice tight fit. And that looks pretty good right there. Why don't you tack it? All right, now for the wall cap, a little glue and then we'll nail it off. We apply a bead of glue at the top edge of the Scotia and at the corners and secure it with some brads.
All right. Another piece of the finish work completed. We're getting there. We sure are. While work continues here in Rhode Island, there's another team of craftsmen up in Vermont who are making all the light fixtures for our house. Recently, Kevin checked out that story. Ever since the beginning of our project, we have worked with lighting designer Evelyn Audet. And Evelyn works with a lighting manufacturer that she thinks is perfect for our homeowners. Now, Evelyn, you have worked with this manufacturer for years, and now you've brought me up to Vermont to see their work. You obviously love their fixtures. I do love their fixtures. They're taking metal, and they're creating beautiful pieces of art that are light fixtures. Oh, they really are beautiful, aren't they? They are. And today we have Dave Carr, who's an engineer, and he's going to show us the process of how the fixtures are made. Hey, Dave. Hello. So what is your guys' process? Well, we have the uh, challenge and the fun of taking a two-dimensional artistic concept mm -hmm. and using a series of tools that are relatively easy to manipulate. We imagine oh. how we might create the piece of steel that you have in your hands. Look at that. So that's a piece of foam, and you've got some paper down here as well. A lot easier to bend foam and paper than it is to bend steel, that's right? right? We can mock up uh, a series of iterations that ultimately meet the designer's vision. So this finished lamp right here, is this something that's going into our house, something that we're going to make today? Actually, we're going to make something that I think is even better. This is the fixture that's going in the dining room in our house. It's really great because we can get a box shade anywhere, but what makes this unique is the bundle of twigs that's put under this fixture. Kevin, we're making this now. Why don't we go out and see it happen? Oh, I'd love to. Kevin, we're in the forge now. This is where we heat the steel to capture that design intent. Each one of these ovens is called a forge? Correct. We have seven of them here. They're running at about 2,000 degrees. Woo. In this area, we have 10 people making about 100 designs a day. Typically, on a good day, we'll put out 1,000 products. Wow. So how are we getting started here, Dave? To make the twigs for your fixture, we start out with a 20-foot rod of half-inch steel. We cut it to length, and then we introduce it to the forge at 2,000 degrees. And then once it comes out, what's this machine here? It's called a trip hammer. It's probably 150 years old, not unlike many of the tools here. And we do a random pattern of what we call munching on that bar to create the design piece. It's literally just slamming down onto that steel, deforming it. Tons of pressure, many, many, many hits. At the end of the munching process, the, the hammering has deformed the steel, so it won't fit into the next tool. So we have to hand straighten it with a hammer and by eye so that it's ready to go for the downstream operation. To make the signature bend on this twig, we place it in this press. Is it still hot at this point? Oh, it's cold. You can handle it barehanded. At this point, the forge process is complete. Wow, it has already come a long way. I mean, it is no longer that perfectly smooth piece of steel. It's organic. I mean, it's textured. It really is starting to look like a twig. After the forging process, we need to remove the slag, and we do that with these ball bearings that we throw at the part at incredible speeds. So you're effectively sandblasting the steel now? Right, 30 seconds worth. And so we've got a giant sandblasting chamber? Correct. That's two chambers, one that we can load and unload while the other's doing the work around the back side. After two passes, the slag is gone and it's completely clean. Next, we put the twigs in a vibrator or tumbler filled with ceramic abrasive media. Think of it as stones. That will give the surface a frosted appearance or patina. Now we begin assembly in the weld area. For the twigs, we use a series of three tools or jigs to hold the parts in position so we can weld them. So what kind of welding is this? This is TIG welding, tungsten inert gas. In this process, we use an electrode that strikes an arc, creates a liquid pool of steel on the part into which we put filler rod for a strong weld. So Ed takes two twigs, welds them into a pair, takes three of those pair, and welds them into a final product. So after a weld, we need to wash the product. So we have two things to accomplish. One is we have to eliminate the weld bluing that you see here. Those are signs of actually a good weld. And the second is to prepare the product for painting. It has to be super clean. 
in this instance, you'll see that after wash, the weld bluing is eliminated. This is ready to go. We can paint it. And so where are we now? So we're in the powder coat room where we spray a negatively charged paint cloud to a grounded steel part, in this case our twigs. The two are attracted to one another and the paint sticks. So then we send it through a convection oven where for 20 minutes we cure it at 380 degrees. The paint particles are cross-linked, creating a very durable finish that's translucent, allows us to see both the texture and the color through the paint. Kevin, this is where it all comes together. All right. We have our twigs that we follow through the process. Yep. And we are marrying them up with the components that have been finished uh, identically. All the processes are the same for them. So everything's finished right here on site, sort of to keep that look consistent? That's right. All right. Now we add the electrical components, a double socket here, grounding. All right, so four light bulbs are going to go into that one. Then we check for continuity and high voltage for safety. Right. And then we begin the pack process. We're going to ship this in a couple packages for safety. Sure. But let's look at the finished product. Oh, you assembled one for us. So nice of you. Look <laughs> at that beauty. What do you think, Evelyn? I love it. I think that they've thought of everything with putting the diffuser on the bottom of the fixture, which shields the lamp from your view when you're sitting at a dining room table. You're not going to be looking at the exposed right. light bulbs. And it just shows the great assembly of twigs that they've put together for us and finished so beautifully. Looks to me like you made the right choice, and thanks for bringing us to Vermont to show us the whole operation. Dave, it's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. Thank you. You're welcome. Tile work is well underway in all the bathrooms, and up here in the master bath, Andy is installing the tile. So you do tile as well? Yes, we do. In fact, the whole crew does tile. That's great. Now, I noticed some kind of a mat on the floor, which is a sign of some kind of floor heat. That is not the primary heat, though, for the bathroom. We have the hydro air system that was put in, and our heat comes out of the vents on the ceiling, and this heat is just to warm your feet when you come in in the morning. Right, well normally we would do that with hydronic tubing. Right, and that is ideally the case. But this was a late decision by Jeff and Michelle, so we're using an electric mat. And the electric mat has a coil that runs through it. Okay, uh, coated. Just, just the wire, yeah. And this heats up underneath the tile and then heats the tile. Oh, that mat is very sticky. It is, and what that allows us to do is stick it down to the subfloor so it doesn't move around when we spread our thin set. All right. Well, obviously you can't cut the wire, but you can cut the mat, and that allows you to turn it and run it back and forth throughout the room. Right, and that's why it has to be very specific to the room, the size of our mm -hmm. mat. In this case, we had to order a 45 square foot mat so that it would cover the floor so everything would be warm. Right. Well, you're not driving any nails in this floor, but I would certainly be concerned of nicking this wire and not finding out about it until later. That would be a disaster. I hate to rip up the floor after the fact. And that's why we have this device here. It tells us if something should happen to the wire. And when that goes off, we know that there's a problem. So then we can repair the wire according to the manufacturer's recommendation. Right. Great idea. It's like the pressure gauge on a hydronic system. Yes. So how do you control the heat in the floor? Well, we have a thermostat which controls the uh, temperature of the floor and the air. So it makes it nice and consistent along with our heat that right. heats the house. So it balances it all out. Absolutely. Now, I'm not used to seeing 12 by 12 tiles in a bathroom. Usually it's mosaic. So is there anything tricky about the layout? Symmetry is everything. And especially when you have a condition where you have a vertical wall at this tub deck, you want to make sure that it looks nice with the floor so that we have an equal piece there and an equal piece over there. That's very important because these vertical surfaces really do stick out. They do, especially when you're sitting here in the morning and looking at it. You want it to look nice. All right. Now you're using what looks like a thin set and you're totally embedding the wire in the thin set. Yes, we're using a good quality uh, latex modified thin set so that it will move with the expansion and contraction of the warm floor. Mm -hmm. That's very important. So you ready to set a few tiles? Yep. So we're using these spacers to give us a perfect 3 16 grout joint. Mm -hmm. Well, Andy, I know you're a busy guy, so I'm going to let you get back to it. Sounds good. Thanks, Norm.
The east side of our house is really just this narrow alley, about 20 feet from the neighbor's house. But Richard, it's a great place to hide your equipment. It absolutely is. This week we got to install our heat pump air conditioners, one for the first floor, one for the second floor. So these are heat pumps? They are. They work like normal air conditioners in the summer, taking heat from inside the building. But in the spring and the fall, we can actually find heat out here and send it in to be used. Great, two for one. But you know, it seems that they get bigger and bigger every year. Well, as manufacturers race towards higher and higher efficiency, the net result is that the equipment gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And these are very efficient units. Okay. So they're gonna be big. <laughs> Let me show you something upstairs. Another thing that makes this house efficient is its insulation. It is tight. Spray foam insulation, you got great windows. A lot of people don't think about how to get fresh air into a building this tight. Right. Now up in this attic, in this crawl space, we've got an energy recovery ventilator tucked away. I'm not going to take you up there. Thank you. This is what the unit looks like up there. It's brutally simple inside. It has two fans. It'll push air across this core. Now we live by a couple of rules. One is heat goes to cold. Right. And the other is high pressure goes to low or high humidity goes to low. Okay. So the heart of the system is a core right here. This is a sample of it. Now you can see there are corrugated layers and actually the corrugations go in opposing directions each layer. Mm -hmm. So it allows the air to pass this way, the next layer to go this way without touching. So the air is in close proximity but it never touches. That's right. It'll allow actually the heat to be transferred to the next layer and also the humidity. All right. So how is this working in say the winter time? Perfect. You've got in the winter. You've got bathrooms and kitchens, and you've got smells that come from the kitchen range hood, and that's going to come into this port right here. Okay. The fan will come on, and this air is warm. It's going to cross the core. At the same time, you've got air right here from outside. What's that going to be? That's going to be cold and dry. Absolutely. So here is this cold air coming here. Heat goes to cold. So now that means that the heated air that you already paid for to heat, 70% of it will stay in the building but you'll still exhaust that bad air outside. So we get efficiency. And you'll get to keep some of the humidity inside the building. And then does it work the opposite way in the summertime? In air conditioning, it's absolutely the same because now you don't want to bring all that humid air from outside and hot right. and have to condition that. All right, well, when it comes to efficiency, Richard, we're glad you are on the case. Thank you, sir. Okay, so until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Rich Trithewey for This Old House. Coming up next time, Welcome back to this old house in Barrington, Rhode Island. Well, today it's all about tile at our project house. Now, we've used glass tile in the past, and it's a little bit tricky to install because you can see through it. And that's what Andy's working on today. And we're getting a gas stove today. Mark, what are we putting in? Well, Kevin, this is a direct vent gas stove. And oh, yeah, look at that flame. There you go. And we'll install a new railing system that preserves our views of Narragansett Bay. That's next time, right here on this old house.